The JFK 35 podcast is made possible through generous support from the Blanche and Irving Laurie Foundation. And then imagine the Constitution of the United States, which begins in its first line. What is it? We the people. There's never been another system of government and law that begins with such a first line. This week, the JFK Library invited actors to its President's Day Festival to portray historical figures like President Thomas Jefferson. Today, we'll speak with two of those performers and ask them what it's like to bring history alive. Next on JFK 35. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Hello, I'm Matt Porter. Welcome to this episode of JFK 35. Each February, we take a moment to celebrate our past presidents and American history on President's Day. The JFK Library hosts its annual President's Day Festival, which features actors who play past historical figures like Presidents John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and Abraham Lincoln, among others. I was able to sit down with two of those living history interpreters, Audrey Stuck Gerard from Boston, who has played Abigail Adams and other 18th century women for the last 10 years, and Bill Barker from Charlottesville, Virginia, who has played Thomas Jefferson for more than 40 years. This is my interview with them. I guess the first question is, what is it like to be a living history interpreter, to put yourself in the shoes of someone who lived, in your cases, hundreds of years ago? Ladies first, Audrey. <laughs> <laughs> I would say there is a lot of responsibility when you step into someone's shoes like this, since these were real people who had firm beliefs and thoughts and consequences to their actions. You don't want to misrepresent or, or necessarily put words in their mouth or use someone's legacy or personal history to tell a different story than their own. So it, it's a constant juggle of is this something, in my circumstance, is, would this, is this something that Abigail actually thought, believed, would act on, versus is this me pulling a little bit of Abigail's personality and using it for my own agenda? So there's some, yeah, definitely some, some heavy weight uh, along with that. But when you have a person you're portraying who is as in-depth and has such a legacy in the historical record as Abigail Adams or Thomas Jefferson, that is a wonderful, wonderful resource because we actually do have letters and correspondence things where we can see in her own handwriting, this is Abigail saying, I believe this about this. So good tools, and it makes it a bit easier not to misrepresent them when you're able to use their actual words. Mm -hmm. Right on, and particularly the letters between Thomas Jefferson and Abigail Adams. Uh, I couldn't agree more with that weight and responsibility that is on one's shoulders to, um, to get these individuals right, uh, to be able to step in their shoes in their world, and uh, to realize the great differences over 200 years in time. Often we submit ourselves to what is called presentism. And in this uh, particular year, 2023, uh, to be too ready to put on to the past, uh, what we take for granted today without realizing uh, this was a different world 200 years ago, 250, 300 years ago, that so much was still the wilderness and the, and the forest primeval in North America, that there were very few urban markets or centers of trade and commerce, that most people lived on farms and that most people were continuing to migrate westward, westward into the wilderness. And when you take on that persona and that frame of mind and that witnessing of that particular world, you're trying to tell a story and you're trying to hope the future will be able to see see into that past, see something different than what we see every day here in our modern world, and come to a better understanding of these individuals in their time 
and what they were doing in order to improve their conditions and in order to hope the future will be able to, to live a better life, a healthier life, a more free life, to, that the future might fulfill their capacity much more to what they want to be than might be possible in the, in the early 19th century or the 18th century. And this gets to a point I want to ask both of you, but I'll start with you, Bill. You know, you're both men and women out of time, right? You you exist in a different century, a different period of American development, but the people who are interacting with you live today and see you see both of your um, characters' legacies through visions of today. For example, Bill, you know, I'm sure this is a common question. I saw you get it today at the President's Day Festival here. Thomas Jefferson's problematic um, relationships with having slaves. And obviously in today's culture, um, that is a very different um, situation than for Jefferson who lived in the 18th century. How do you how do you answer questions like that? How do you prepare yourself to try to answer not as Bill Barker, mm. the person who understands the character and the time, but as Thomas Jefferson who doesn't live during today's time and needs to talk to someone who does and explain your relationship there? Well, first and foremost, to hope the individual is familiar with our Declaration of American Independence, because there's his stand upon this particular subject. Jefferson knows the question that's going to be asked even before you ask it, because he's been asked it. He's had to uh, struggle and wrestle with this during his own life. He was born into a slave-owning society. He inherited at the age of 14 his father's freeholdings, meaning that his father, Colonel Peter Jefferson, owned at that time over 3,500 acres uh, outright. There was no debt and that Colonel Peter Jefferson owned the majority of families living on that acreage. So this is the world into which Jefferson was born. This is representative in his time and in his person and family, the former colony of Virginia in the midst of 12 other colonies, and that there was slavery in every single one of them. And this was not overnight. This was for generations. This is for centuries. And to know that Jefferson and many others have written that while we were the colonies of Great Britain, there was nothing we could do to end the importation of enslaved. And we tried to end it. Uh, even before he wrote the Declaration of American Independence, he wrote what was titled The Summary View of the Rights of British America. Uh, this was published in Williamsburg the summer of 1774. It was brought up to Philadelphia for the First Continental Congress which Jefferson had hoped to attend. He fell ill. He couldn't go there. And so his name does not even appear on this pamphlet. But my point he writes, and you can find copies of this still available on the bottom of page 16 to the top of page 17, for the most trifling reasons, I quote, and sometimes for no conceivable reason at all, His Majesty has denied laws of the most salutary tendency. The abolition of domestic slavery is the general desire in those colonies in which it first began. But previous to the freeing of the enslaved we have, it is necessary to cease any further importations, and yet are repeated at attempts to effect that by prohibitions, by duties, by petitions which might amount to a prohibition, have received His Majesty's negative, end quote. So this is two years before he writes, not only the first two paragraphs of the Declaration, all men are created equal, and by that, men, capitalized, means mankind. Uh, they all understood we're not created equal in face or form. We're not created equal in mental capacity, one individual compared with another. But we are all created free in nature. We're all born free. The second part of the Declaration is a long litany of all of the re uh, grievances for which we never received redress. And so we hope the future will understand, as Jefferson and the 13 colonies all understood, we're told we have all the rights of Englishmen, particularly the right to petition for redress of grievances, and yet we're not represented in Parliament. We have no representation. You know, people yell, taxes, taxes. The taxes were minimal, and anyone could have afforded to pay those taxes, particularly the threepenny tax on tea. It is the fact that that there was no representation. So my point within that litany of grievances, he also writes 
The king is indeed a tyrant for ignoring our petitions to end the importation of enslaved, for capturing our poor people, bringing them halfway about the globe to subject them to indentured servitude for life, waging cruel war against a people who never did him any harm. Now, you may all search for that clause within those grievances. You're not going to find it because two delegates representing two different colonies, the one South Carolina, the other Georgia, refused to vote on behalf of the Declaration so long as that clause remained in there. So that clause was struck in order to maintain, what did Lincoln have to work on? Well, uh, nigh 100 years later, in order to maintain the Union. What are we going to do to keep us together? That's the most remarkable thing we've accomplished to begin with, to bring 13 individual nations together. So this subject of slavery will continue to divide our new nation, and we will no longer be able to blame it on the British. This is something that Jefferson is going to contend with when he has the honor, before he leaves the presidency, to sign legislation that ends the importation of enslaved to our nation, but it does not end the commerce. And when we have that Missouri Compromise, admitting Maine as the 23rd state free, and then we admit the vast territory of Missouri as our 24th state enslaved, what does Jefferson say? <laughs> this is a fire bell in the night. It could signal the knell of our union. All I fear do not see that speck on our horizon that will fall upon us as a great tornado. So you realize this grappling upon this particular subject is something that Jefferson and so many, many others, the Adams particularly, oh my heavens, the Adams and Franklin and Alexander Hamilton grappled with their entire lives. If I may, I'd like yes. to add to this uh, very eloquently spoken, Bill, about uh, the efforts and ideas of the people living in the time period, even the those conflicted with the circumstance of own enslaving people owning humans and also trying to lay the groundwork for hopefully a nation where that would not be the case someday uh, but very complicated and, and no one person had answers and and as we all know eventually there was civil war as a result of it but speaking to the question of of ourselves as 21st century people bringing to life the story of these 18th century personas i personally audrey find it very important to lay out the complexities of a person. It's it's very easy, for example, in contrasting Jefferson in the South and Adams in the North to say, oh, well, the North didn't have the slaves and whatnot. You know, there were certainly enslaved people in the Northern colonies in the early Northern states. And while John Adams and Abigail Adams did not own any humans themselves. Abigail grew up in a house with enslaved servants and lived and interacted with them uh, on a regular basis. And then after slavery was ended in Massachusetts, she there were a few people who had been part of her father's house. A, a woman, an enslaved woman named Phoebe Abdi, who was a, a very dear person in Abigail's life for the rest of her life, and ended up being one of Abigail's tenants for years. When she went to, to Europe to join John, she asked Phoebe to live in their house rent-free so that it would be seen to and, and Phoebe got the benefit of living without rent for several years and Abigail got the benefit of making sure that the house wasn't being vandalized or you know going to ruin but these are complicated circumstances and even then even though she was a supporter of universal education and very boldly spoke up about the fact that black people should have education should have opportunities it is also clear in her writings that she had difficult feelings around people of color and certainly some of that white guilt and certainly some of the fear of the unknown uh, while there were enslaved people in new england in the early years of of the nation they were outnumbered by white people in the area and so abigail had some heebie-jeebies <laughs> uh, around racial politics that I, I, Audrey, want to make sure I am being clear about because I, I would never want to say, oh no, well, they didn't own slaves, so they were fine and they were completely absolved of that, uh, you know, human sin of, of having enslaved people. No, it was complicated and certainly the Adamses, even without owning slaves themselves, were beneficiaries of a system where it was so very entrenched. So it is difficult to straddle the line of speaking 
as she felt and saying, no, I, I want to make sure that you know, there's this young black man in my service has a full education. I want to make sure that Phoebe is a respected woman, but also some really awkward things to wrap your head around as as a person in the 21st century. And, and I, I don't want to misrepresent or, or make it seem like it's absolved. Exactly. And or, or make it seem like we're making excuses either. I mean, because they are in many ways excuses when you look at it from 200 years in the future that but then what about in their time you know how may they be judged in their time with what they have inherited as to what they are doing about it you know and maybe a lot of that is is stalling or maybe a lot of that is increasing fear and concern of what could happen you know jefferson wrote something very profound in his time he said far too many incongruities and accusations against these people will for so long will not be easily forgotten by them so he foresaw things and they both had issues it's really great for the, to know that you guys have done so much work to see what they've written to be able to talk about these issues i do want to touch on a few other things Audrey, this goes to you, which is Thomas Jefferson is fairly well known, covered well in the history books. And, you know, some would probably say, unfortunately, the first ladies are not often covered as well. So for you, when you're probably talking to an audience who knows maybe not very much about Abigail Adams or who she was, what is that like for you? And what are those conversations that you tend to have with people who interact with you? Really good question. And and you are entirely right. Too, too often the women of history are not fully documented or, or have their the, the flesh of their personas uh, really brought forward and, and left for the average person to see. And even someone like Abigail Adams, who is honestly a household name with most Americans. People have heard of John Adams. They know he was president and they've probably heard of Abigail as well. That makes her one of the women of the 18th century that we really know a great deal about. But even then, she's normally just distilled down to that three-word phrase, remember the ladies. And and the letter in which she wrote the phrase, remember the ladies, is important. She put forward a lot of interesting ideas in, in that exchange and, and the following letters between her and John where they sort of rattle back and forth about in this new nation that we're devising. So 1776, when they're writing these letters to each other. As we are coming up with this new code of laws and conduct, and we're thinking towards these utopian ideals, how do we construct a, a city on a hill, shining new nation? Remember that there are half of us in this country who have previously been overlooked. But still, yes, just those three words is such an oversimplification of this person. Portraying Abigail is incredibly fortunate because we do have her words and writing. So many women who, even if they were somehow at some point in the historical record, either through their own letters or writing or some documentation of something that happened in their lives, far too often either those personal letters or writings were destroyed at the end of their lives or the stories the narratives are all crafted within the realm of the men that they lived near uh, so that you have you know you you learn about dolly madison because you learn about president madison and it's it's this little subset to the historical narrative so having a person who's hundreds of letters that she wrote to her husband, to her sisters, her children, her cousins, friends, for decades of her life is a beautiful treasure trove of a resource to be able to operate off of and, and to bring this person to life again. And one of the things I find most interesting is not just when you're interacting with, again, people from the 21st century, but when you interact with each other. And in the case of you two, you, you're both of you live, both of your characters lived at the same time together. And your husband, who is also here on President's Day, um, can interact with you. How do you guys, because to me, it's very interesting to see how you guys actually talk to each other and kind of like react to each other. What do you guys feel about that and how you prepare to like, you know, you're not just walking encyclopedias or dictionaries but you are living people that say like hey i i remember you and things like that you know sometimes you bill barker playing jefferson and the uh, adam sometimes get a little prickly at times tell us a little bit about what you do when you encounter each other and what that what's that like for you well i audrey i think you'd agree we're we're actors 
Mm-hmm. We're actors, so you know it is our job, it is our art uh, to take on that persona, to take on that character, to take on the innards and outers, outsides of these individuals as they feel and interact with one and the other. So it's like when you're on stage between the time the curtain goes up and the curtain goes down, that's all that the audience is going to see as you stand there interacting, reciting lines out of a play. But when you're interpreting, when you're in that first person historical persona, Persona. Yeah, they're the lines as the script, more or less. But if you try to get every single word of those letters between them uh, scripted in what you're saying, oh, it, it's dull. I mean, it, are you really performing it unless mm-hmm. you're truly interacting it and realizing, well, they may have used those words for that particular letter, but when they're speaking with one and the other, they're using different words. They're, they're human. They're interacting. They're able to look at one and the other and get a sense of vibes and, and feelings that are coming from one and the other. Right. And, and, and I think that's the job, isn't it? That's the effort to breathe history so it can come alive and and sustain itself in the future. It's also interesting to, as as Bill and I do, sometimes the the events that we do, there is a specific day in history that we are inhabiting and living in. This is August 1st of 1801, and President Jefferson is recently in office, and the Adamses are back home in Massachusetts. and, And at that point, there were some very strong beliefs that was not a happy time between Mr. Jefferson and the Adamses and it would be years until they began correspondence again Abigail actually uh, began writing to Mr. Jefferson before John did uh, after this period of time because of the passing of Jefferson's daughter who as a younger child Abigail had watched um, and cared for for a period of time when they were living in England and in that interim time, so you know, the end of the Adams presidency, beginning of Jefferson's presidency, some strong animosity uh, b- between these people. But if you look at an earlier period of their life, they're enthralled with the brilliance of each other's minds and the way they can share their fascination with literature and high ideals and art and culture and everything they experience together. And then later in their life, especially between John, who outlived Abigail, and, and between uh, Thomas Jefferson, a, an appreciation of the places they had been and a realization of you know, this is this is the legacy of what we have left in history and if we continue to write to each other we can have a new chapter and, and that friendship was rekindled so it's also hard to go back and say all right if it's if it's one day in history I can definitely pinpoint Abigail felt this way about Thomas Jefferson in August of 1801 if you say, I am Abigail from the amorphous time period of the life of Abigail Adams, um, then you have a whole range of feelings and opinions about these people you're interacting with. So like Bill said, it, it does go to those moments of living and breathing in the, in the shoes of the person and being able to, to pick up on, on what's being put forward by the other actor who is bringing life to their own persona. And this has been such a great conversation. I wish I could keep asking you so many more questions, but I'm going to ask you guys one more question for both of you, which is in your work, studying your character's history, is there a particular part of their story, part of their history, moment in their life that for you, you really grab on and are like, this is something about Abigail that I really you know, connect with or really resonate with. And the same for um, Thomas Jefferson. And we'll start with Abigail. I've been thinking about this a lot recently because I am working on another program that is one of those amorphous Abigail Adams of her life rather than one specific day. Um, So trying to pick sort of the central theme of what I'll talk about. Abigail, at the tail end of her life, when she realized that she was approaching her final years, wrote a will of sorts. Now, it wasn't, wasn't a legal document because women had no right to own property of their own. Everything that was owned by Abigail was actually owned by John. So she had no legal standing to write a will of her own. But Decades prior, she had, from a little inheritance she had gotten from when her mother passed away, started making investments or or using that little bit of capital to acquire what she called her pin money, (laughs) which she then often put back to the use for her family, either purchasing stocks and bonds, uh, you know, making investments to to further the family, buying land in northern Vermont um, (laughs) that she would bequeath to her children. Uh, But so she had these this little bit that she truly did hold in her heart and believe as her own, even though there was no legal standing to it. And at the end of her life, she made provision for the 
the remaining benefits of that little bit that she believed to be her own to be bequeathed to a little bit to her two surviving sons, but primarily the people she recognized were her granddaughters and her nieces, especially the unmarried ones. So these young women who she wanted to make sure had just that little bit more leg up because they didn't they were not legally provided for by the state or by the country so she left shares of the weymouth toll bridge to her granddaughters and used those last actions to further promote the women who would come after her and that action so beautifully encapsulates what she lived her life trying to do yeah so that's that's my Abigail mm, beautiful moment. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's great. Yeah, you know it's it's a privilege to be able to do what we do, and to to share it, and and breathe that life from the past, uh, so that people might get a a sense of that uh, that breath uh, today. Part of that is being able to portray Mr. Jefferson on site at Monticello upon the grounds he actually walked through the house that he designed and saw so much life in that house. And by that, I mean not only births, but marriages and more than their fair share of death inside that house and around uh, Monticello and his adjoining farms. But another privilege is being able to uh, to come here to the John F. Kennedy Library and Museum and breathe that life into uh, so much of what uh, President Kennedy represented. I remember those days. I remember them vividly. And I remember that President Kennedy often quoted uh, Thomas Jefferson. In fact, I believe that uh, there was only one other 20th century president that quoted Jefferson as much, and that was Franklin D. Roosevelt, uh, with whom Joseph P. Kennedy was quite familiar as he served as uh, our ambassador to England during FDR's administration. Uh, so to come up to the JFK Library and Museum and to do this work, to breathe this history, history which was such a love of President Kennedy as we already know, and see the present generations kind of see that little that glimmer of hope and to sense that spirit which is so much of who we are as Americans that President Kennedy represented, it is a deeply moving and emotional experience. And, uh, you know, we're sitting here now in this particular room looking at photographs of President Kennedy on the wall. And there is a vitality and there is a a youth, but there is a spirit that he represented in those days, those early 60s. And while this museum does such a wonderful job of resuscitating, reinvigorating that spirit, it also does equally as wonderful a job as portraying what he contended with. What President Kennedy contended with during his short, short time and what we're still contending with and hope that that spirit can be, remain alive in us to continue to rectify things that could otherwise tear us apart. You know, it's interesting that um, we still look upon Thomas Jefferson or Abigail Adams and John Adams, as you were saying, you know, they leave us uh, their letters, they leave us a lot of the words, but there's still so much about them we don't know. And I cannot help but think in what has only been a short history, what, 50 years ago, that this was President Kennedy's uh, last year mm-hmm. as president, 50 years ago. And I cannot help but think of that bi- biography, and I, I beg pardon that I'm forgetting the author, but what a wonderful title, Johnny, We Hardly Knew Ye. And look how it resonates now, 50 years later, and we're still coming here, and we're still revisiting and wanting to know him uh, in his history. So this resonates from one generation to the next as Americans, our spirit. I don't think I could have said it better. And thank you for both of you, because because of your work, we are also able to continue to revisit Abigail Adams and Thomas Jefferson and the other living history presidents and first ladies of our time. So thank you for giving of your time to come here. And thank you for taking a moment to talk to us on the podcast. Thank you so thank much you for having us. It's a much. pleasure to be a part of this. Thank you for joining us today. Bill Barker and Audrey Struck Gerard's performances from this year's President's Day Festival are available to watch online. 
You can find links to their performances as well as the performances of Presidents John Adams and Abraham Lincoln on our podcast page. If you have questions or story ideas, email us at jfk35pod at jfklfoundation.org or tweet at us at jfklibrary using the hashtag jfk35. If you liked what you heard today, please consider subscribing to our podcast or leaving us a review wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening and have a great day.